Okay. I come from a baseball family. My father was uh, uh, a Detroit Tiger, uh, signed off the campus of the University of Notre Dame in 1940 or 1941, played minor league baseball for uh, a few years, and then spent all or part of six seasons with the Tigers uh, as a backup first baseman and outfielder. Uh, he played behind uh, at first base, a very good player named Rudy York, but he also had a chance to be uh, a part of the 1945 World Championship team in Detroit. Uh, they managed to uh, to beat the Chicago Cubs uh, and uh, were world champions in 1945. Um, he retired uh, from uh, playing in uh, following, I believe, the 1947 season, and became a front office executive with the Tigers. He rose to be the general manager there uh, in 1959. Uh, he left the Tigers and moved to Milwaukee to become uh, general manager of the Milwaukee Braves. Uh, he was also president and stayed there until the Braves moved to Atlanta in 1962. Uh, in 1967, he uh, was recruited by uh, the owners to come to New York to serve as the administrator of baseball for uh, General Spike Eckert, uh, who was uh, commissioner for a short time. Uh, and in uh, 1968, he joined uh, the ownership group uh, in Montreal, who uh, sought and obtained an expansion franchise, which became the Montreal Expos. He retired from the Expos, and uh, he was uh, president uh, Chairman, Chief Executive Officer of the Expos, uh, intermittently was the general manager, but uh, tried not to do that job on a regular basis. And he retired from the Expos uh, following the 1986 season, and uh, then was uh, sort of a, a freelance consultant for a while, and then uh, focused on his golf game. Uh, my mother was uh, also from Detroit, as was my father, and uh, she was the niece of Walter O. Briggs, who uh, owned the uh, Tigers until approximately 1956 or 57, when uh, uh, Mr. Briggs died and the club was sold to uh, a group of uh, industrialists from uh, the state of Michigan, including John Fetzer, who eventually became the sole owner. So uh, I, I've got it from uh, both sides of my family. Hmm. Tell us a little bit about what what you're doing now, or how you got here. And oh, sure. Uh, I, I uh, began my career in the game uh, in Colorado uh, in 1995 during the player strike. Uh, I moved to uh, Detroit and became the president of the Tigers. Uh, we had a terrific uh, adventure project uh, there, uh, building New Comerica Park and leaving Old Tiger Stadium. In 2001, at the request of Commissioner Seelig, uh, I left the Tigers and went to St. Petersburg, Florida to be the Chief Operating Officer uh, for the Tampa Bay Devil Rays, who at that time were having some uh, ownership disagreements. And the uh, idea was that uh, perhaps an executive from outside the organization without particularly strong ties to either of the factions could settle things down. I hope I did that. Uh, about 10 months later, Commissioner Seelig asked me to come here to serve as Executive Vice President for Administration. And uh, I did that until he retired in, uh, at, the end of, at the end of 2014. Uh, since then, I have been Special Assistant to uh, Commissioner Manfred doing a wide, wide variety of things uh, as needed, focusing particularly on health and welfare plans that uh, we have in effect and, and administer for the game from this office. Uh, I do some uh, research and uh, recommendations concerning uh, disputes between clubs on various matters, and uh, I, I do some work uh, under the collective bargaining agreement concerning the disposition of uh, appeals uh, made by players for on-field discipline. Hmm. Very interesting. So you went to Notre Dame and then eventually moved to Denver? 
Yes, I, I, I graduated from Notre Dame in 1971. Uh, I spent a year teaching and coaching in uh, South Florida near my family's home. And uh, then I went to law school at Boston College. Uh, when I left Boston College, I moved to Washington and I worked there uh, as a congressional liaison officer for the Consolidated Rail Corporation, which was uh, the uh, result of uh, the bankruptcy and reorganization of the Penn Central, Erie Lackawanna, and eight other, or I'm sorry, six other uh, Northeastern Railroads. Uh, I went to Georgetown uh, University Law Center at night at that time for a Master's of Law with a concentration in labor law. And uh, after about five years, uh, had had enough. I had a lot of friends who were, uh, who seemed to have a much better uh, work-life balance in uh, Colorado, and so I joined them out there in 1981. Okay, and about that time, Federico Pena was there, just about ready to run for office, and they were setting up the Denver Baseball yes. Commission. Did you get involved in that? Uh, I did. Uh, through some friends, uh, I met Steve Kadich, who uh, was uh, a tireless advocate for baseball in Colorado, and he recruited me to become part of the Denver Baseball Commission. Uh, we represented Denver as a relocation or expansion site to uh, major league owners at, at various winter meetings, major league meetings. Uh, he and Dean Bonham uh, did great work in uh, attracting exhibition games, especially uh, games between uh, the end of spring training and the beginning of the, of the uh, regular season and uh, other baseball-themed events over the course of uh, five or six years. Right. Were you just a volunteer on that yes. committee? Yes. Yeah, I was uh, just a volunteer. Uh, I think the hope was that uh, perhaps uh, callers might mistake me for my father and either take the call <laughs> or return the call. <laughs> we might be able to get some, uh, some kind of connections going. Right. So did you go with Steve and others to any of the Major League meetings during that time? Yes, uh, I did. I, I, uh, I went to uh, at least a handful of, uh, of winter meetings where we would uh, try to uh, corner uh, unsuspecting executives and uh, make sure they knew about Denver and uh, explain to them uh, Denver's long history of support for baseball and the enthusiasm of the new mayor for Major League Baseball and, uh, uh, you know, the kind of things that you do when you're trying to advance the interests of your city. Right. Well, at that point, what did you think Denver's chances were of getting a team? Well, uh, it, it had been a very strong AAA club for, for a long time. Uh, it was obviously a, a, a growing area of the country. It had attracted me, and I liked it uh, awfully well there, so I was quite sure that many other people would, would, would like it as well. Uh, the, the Bears, the Denver Bears, had a long history of, of uh, successful support. The uh, fireworks game was very well known throughout, uh, throughout baseball. Uh, my father's clubs, particularly uh, Milwaukee and Montreal, had had affiliations with, uh, with the Bears over the course of the years and uh, with the, uh, uh, you know, the slight scouting anomaly of trying to evaluate uh, hitters who, who uh, hit at a mile high altitude. Uh, they were very satisfied with uh, the relationship that they had with the Phipps's and, and Jim Burris and uh, it, it just seemed like, a, you know, it seemed like a promising place. In addition, uh, there had been on and off conversations with the Oakland A's and, and perhaps others uh, that, that predated my arrival in Denver, so you know there was at least enough to work with. When you when you were at the meetings, did they talk about having to get a new stadium? Neil, the the, uh, the there were two comments that were almost uh, always raised, and, and that was certainly the first one. Uh, people didn't know that Mile High was originally built as a baseball stadium then converted to a football stadium, but everybody that commented on it or had seen it thought it was too big and, and too awkward and not, not uh, suitable for Major League Baseball. And the other thing they always wanted to know was uh, where was the Coors family in all this? So th those were, right. the, those were the, you know, the kind of two questions that we, we always Right, Steve so said exactly the same thing. <laughs> 
Um, so did you hear about the legislation that was introduced to build a new stadium? Um, I, I have been trying to reflect on the sequence of events, uh, and uh, I, I believe that uh, I believe it went as follows. Uh, John DeCue bought the minor league club uh, and, and renamed the club to Zephyrs. At some point, the national uh, Senator Worth, uh, for, with others, formed a committee to, to look into expansion and and let uh, the American League and, and the uh, National League know that the Senate was interested in how this process was going. Uh, and uh, finally, some steps were taken to potentially address. The first of the two biggest questions that we always received: What are you going to do about Mile High Stadium? And uh, a, a very well thought out, very flexible, very uh, uh, well designed piece of legislation was passed by the legislature that would provide for the imposition imposition of a tax if and only if a franchise was awarded to the district, uh, and that kindly seem to uh, provide a basis for uh, assuring major league owners that whatever franchise might be awarded was not going to play a Mile High Stadium for the foreseeable future. Right, right. So Governor Romer appointed you to the stadium district board. Yes, I, I, I have also been trying to remember how that happened and I, I, I don't have a very clear memory. I think Larry Kallenberg called me one day <laughs> to introduce himself and said, Governor's appointed you to uh, to the uh, Denver Metropolitan Major League Baseball Stadium. Well, that was in Denver. part because of your baseball expertise, I'm sure. Uh, I, I was uh, lucky enough to be asked to serve, and uh, uh, I got busy trying to read the bill and figure out what it was we were supposed to do, and uh, of course searched in vain for the uh, budgetary appropriation <laughs> that was, that was going to support our work. But. Right, right. And so then you became chairman of the, of the uh, stadium district. Yeah, I was... Uh, elected chairman by, by my colleagues. We met for a, a couple of months, I think, in a hotel ballroom until uh, Dave Erlinger graciously uh, accorded us space at, uh, at Chaffa, and uh, we used the uh, conference room at Chaffa thereafter. Right. Did you get involved in the election at all? Uh, we, we had uh, certain statutory duties to perform. We had to hold two meetings in each of the counties that was part of the district, and, and we did that over the course of that summer. Uh, we were not, uh, per se, campaigning. Of course, the Colorado Baseball Commission was doing the heavy lifting on, on that side, and, and all of them, including uh, Gary Antonoff and, and Joe Blake, just uh, you know, did a tremendous, tremendous service to, to the cause of baseball. Uh, so we, w we went around to the, uh, to the six counties and uh, held our meetings, but we were otherwise busy trying to figure out uh, what should the ballpark look like, uh, how, how much would it cost, and, and how it would be financed, and, and where should it be. Uh, so did you, at, during that time, go back and talk, talk to Major League Baseball during some of the meetings? Uh, I don't think I went to... Uh, I don't think I went to the winter meetings. Uh, that would have been uh, the 89 winter meetings. But uh, I, I was having uh, a, you know, a fair number of uh, telephone calls from club people that I knew and people in the, in the commissioner's office and the, the National League office that I knew because they had at that time announced that they were going to have a, uh, National League was going to have a timetable for expansion. Right, right. So, um, one of the concerns then became the ownership group, and some of the people that we thought were going to step forward weren't able to step forward. Did you get involved in the ownership process at all? Uh, only uh, to the extent that I was uh, a representative of the stadium board and, and knew something about how the stadium development process was, was going to work. Uh, the governor's office uh, took care of that. And that's an interesting and, and critical 
topic that you raised because uh, I, I remain convinced today that as opposed to the other ultimately successful candidate, we did not have a, a strong, well-financed local person that the league could say, we, we want that person involved. What we had was a stadium deal in a community that loved baseball, and, and that kind of took the place of the personality of the owner, I think. Right, right. So you didn't get involved in any of the putting the ownership group oh, no, together with no. the governor or anything? Okay, all right, because that got complicated, obviously, as time went on. Yeah, it sure did. It, it, got, it got very complicated, and, and it, it never stopped getting complicated until you know, just a few weeks, or maybe months, before uh, the team actually took the field and started to play. Right, and I imagine then you got involved in the planning and designing of the stadium. That's right, yeah. Did you... The, the, it looks a lot like Baltimore's sta stadium, uh, Camden Yards. Uh, the Did, the, uh, the board, okay or, yeah, yeah. The, the, the board uh, was extremely impressed by the presentation from HOK, uh, led by Joe Spear, who had done uh, the design work at Memorial Park at Camden Yards. And uh, the freshness and the uh, evocative nature design in that building ran through baseball like a virus. Oh, really? uh, I mean, everybody was just stunned and, and thrilled by it. And it uh, eventually seemed to the board that the, the people that had done that work combined with wherever we might be able to locate that ballpark uh, among the sites that had been made available to us would be an excellent combination and, and would say baseball to our constituency and, and uh, ultimately uh, to the community for years to come. Right, right. Wasn't the stadium originally designed for 40,000 and then it was bumped to 50? How did that happen? Um, you're exactly right. The, the original design based upon uh, our assumptions of attendance uh, called for a, a ballpark that would be in the 40 to 42,000 range. Uh, it fit the budget and it fit the site and seemed like a, a, a good capacity for a community like ours. Uh, of course you remember in 1993 uh, you were among those who frequented Mile High Stadium <laughs> to a point of in excess of 50,000 people a game. Uh, at that point, the ownership of the club, which had then been vested in uh, three people who had been limited partners and, and ultimately became the general partners, said we can't suddenly tell 8,000 or 10,000 of our fans <laughs> that there's no room for them. We need, we need more seats. So. Uh, the occupancy agreement was amended to provide for a larger ballpark. Uh, the costs were to be borne by, by the club, and uh, some 8,000 seats uh, were added, and they were the, the uh, upper grandstand seats out in right field. In the right field sure. side. Right. And, and that was turned out to be a, a good move for a long, long time. It sure did. It was a, it was a great run, and uh, actually the structure uh, has proved to be sufficiently flexible so that they're doing some new things out there. Yes. Which are, have you been up there? I, I have been up there. Yeah. And, uh, it's very entertaining. It's baseball in sort of a different mode, <laughs> but lots and lots of other clubs uh, have sent teams to see oh, really? what's going on and, really? and mm. it's being imitated throughout the game to a, to a certain extent. Right. Well, when you were um, executive vice president of the Rockies, did you have any unusual or interesting things that happened that would be of interest to anybody watching this? Neil, every day was interesting. Uh, uh, the the uh, process of, of uh, trying to get uh, a baseball organization up and running, uh, of course Bob Gephardt was scouting 600 Major League Baseball players and combining evaluations on them. Larry Bernard was going constantly filing reports. Uh, had to 
Court. He was filing reports. The lights were on at that building on Broadway until all hours of the evening. Um, the, the, the sense of excitement in the community, the, uh, the thrill from uh, our, our very first uh, uh, winter meetings draft of Ryan Turner uh, to the opening of the Bend Club and Scalzitti's Grand Slam home run to win the first organizational game in Colorado's history uh, all the way through. Uh, you know, every, every day was just uh, uh, thrilling and exciting and of course as we prepared for the uh, Major League Draft. Uh, we were also involved in, in litigation uh, in, in uh, Ohio uh, with the, uh, one of the former owners uh, trying to prevent our participation or conform our participation to, to uh, his involvement. Uh, and so I was there and, and Gep was in Denver and then in New York and everything finally worked out and we got to go to the go to the draft and have the draft and uh, once we had a team it was uh, it was really fun and really exciting. Yeah, it turned out to be very exciting. So do you have any final thoughts about the whole process? Uh, I, I do. I, I will always remember this as an experience where so many talented people gave so much of their time and, and, and their professional expertise to help their community. Uh, I mean, it just makes you uh, proud to be a Coloradan and proud to make, to, to, it makes you proud to be a, a Metro Denverite. Uh, I remember that as uh, such a wonderful time in my life and, and mostly it was because of the people in that community that I got to see drop their day-to-day -day work as you did, and uh, put their their uh, professional reputations on the line uh, to try to do things that made their community better. And after 25 years, uh, uh, it's I think it's become a fact of life. Uh, it's a beautiful building. Uh, it's a brilliantly well-supported team. Uh, it's so exciting to watch them the first half of this year that uh, you know, it's just something that I'll, I'll always really feel great about. That's great. All right, well, thank you very okay. much, John. Okay. That was fantastic. <laughs>